So we're coming back from the holidays. We're going to continue the second half of Perek Lamedim, chapter 33 in Tehillim. After this Perek, Bezat Hashem will take a break in Tehillim. Bezat Hashem will begin a new series. So I'll give you more information next week. This Perek is a significant Perek. Lamedim? Lamedim, 33. It is significant because it deals with a topic that is very relevant. Many people are weak in this area, the area of trust in Hashem. One may be observant of the Torah mitzvot, one may have a munah faith, but he cannot bring himself to relate to Hashem as a father, as one who actually overlooks, oversees the world, and all of creation, takes care of our needs, provides for us with whatever we need, whether it's a shiduch, in other words, a spouse, whether it's children, whether it is food, health. There's a lot of needs. We all have needs. And many times we just get used to things. Uh, you know, you get a degree, you get a job, take care of yourself, and uh, everything will be fine. And we don't realize that even though we make the effort, we actually take a course perhaps, we possibly apply for a job, and even though that's all true, that we are doing things on our own, there is somebody in the background that is managing all of this, that is enabling this to happen, and that is Hashem. So Ami said the Jewish nation does not only believe that God created the world, God continues to be involved. And the involvement can be seen in many areas. The beginning of the chapter dealt a little bit more with looking at creation, looking at the beauty and harmony in the design, the great wisdom from which one can gain tremendous uh, strength to believe and to continue to rely on Hashem. However, this is not enough. Even though one can see and one can be impressed by uh, looking at creation and convince himself that this is in fact the handiwork of Hashem, people are forgetful, people run into hard times, and uh, when one is in a hard time, he doesn't think about where is Hashem necessarily because it is not something that he can see with his own physical eyes. It is something that he believes. And you know what they say in English, seeing is believing. <laughs> so if he were to see something con more concrete, perhaps that would help him. But without seeing, a lot of people have a very hard time. So the first part of the chapter is also important. From time to time we need to become impressed, we need to reinforce our, our beliefs, we need to read stories of miraculous events that have occurred in the past, just to remind ourselves that this is all real. This is, you know, something that we can identify with. And David Amela talks about the song or the praise that the righteous should bring themselves to, should uh, compose words on their own, not necessarily the words that are composed for us by the rabbis or in the Siddur, but even on their own. Say words, express words of praise and thanks to the Almighty for your own personal experiences too. And for those who are righteous and who have this clarity that God runs the world, they should be in the first position, the first place to not only express their thanksgiving, the Almighty for all that they have experienced, but to let people know that this is a fact, that they should not give up hope. So this is all in the first half of the Pedic on how the Hashgaha is something that we shouldn't just take for granted that it's there. Yes, it's there, the Hashgaha is there, but that we should actually look for it and point to it and if you look for it, you will see it. So it's important to believe that, that this Ashgaha is real, Ashgaha meaning divine providence, but it's even more important to feel it, 
In other words, to experience it. And everyone can experience it. So with that, we can continue on to Pasuk Yud Gimel, which is where we're holding. Actually, Pasuk Yud Bet. We left off with another important concept that even the non-Jewish world, even those who were our enemies, who conspired against us, who thought of all kinds of plots against us, even those plots, many, many times, were not carried out because Atzat Hashem Hitakum. Atzat Hashem Le'olam Ta'amod, as the Pasuk says. It is the counsel of Hashem. It is Hashem's plan that will always rule, that it will always prevail. So, even though many have planned or plotted against us, there are many instances in our history for those who read the history and who are knowledgeable with our past, that they did not always succeed. And many times we don't even know what they were thinking about. Hashem sometimes performs miracles on his own without even us knowing about it. They are concealed in the same way that he conceals himself. Many of the miracles are concealed. Nonetheless, even though we are limited in how much we can know and see, it is important. I always stress this. It's important for everyone to point this out, to talk about it, to praise Hashem, and to share your own personal experiences with others. Because it, this is the way people will become more convinced and strengthened in their own faith that may be shaky at times. Okay, so Pasuk Yud Bet. Verse 12. Fortunate is the nation that Hashem is their God. The second half of the Pasuk says, Ha'am Bahar the nation that Hashem has chosen as his heritage. Two different types of statements here. One is talking about the goy that worships. Hashem, even though he may be referring to the Jewish people, he's referring to the Jewish nation in both instances, but Goy could also be referring to others as well. So he's saying, fortunate is that nation, whichever nation it may be, Asher Hashem Elokav, if they turn to God and worship Him and not all these statutes, and not all these uh, As deities, what they consider deities that cannot deliver. On the other hand, he points to the Jewish people. We have been chosen as his nahala, as his inheritance, I guess you can say. The significance of this pasuk is twofold. Number one, He's talking about the importance of worshiping Hashem and being careful not to worship anything else. Fortunate are those who do so because Hashem will deliver. If Hashem promises, He fulfills His promise. Those who have been chosen, meaning the Jewish people, they are fortunate for another reason. We have tremendous responsibilities, right? It's not easy to observe all the mitzvot. So where are we fortunate? We are fortunate because we have been chosen for an important task that if we succeed in fulfilling it, in carrying it out, our reward is immense. It reminds me of the famous mashal that is brought down, famous parable of two individuals who came to work for a diamond dealer. And they were gonna be brokers. You know, they get a certain amount of diamonds and they go out and sell their wear, their merchandise. One individual got two diamonds, and the other individual got 20. The one who got 20 begins to complain, how come you're giving me more work? <laughs> Doesn't that sound funny? <laughs> more work? You have a chance to make more money than the other one. You got 20, you only got, I only gave him two. So why do some Jews complain? They don't understand the value of the merchandise that they have. That's what it's all about. So in this pasuk, David Melech is telling us Ashrei, also to instill in us the pride 
of what it is to be Jewish, of what Judaism is. You were chosen. It doesn't mean you were chosen because you're a better person. Many people misunderstand this too. Not because we're smarter, not because we're better. There's good and bad in, in every nation, in every people, in every group, in every family, <laughs> unfortunately. I mean, there's all kinds of people. We were chosen because of all kinds of reasons why Hashem chose us. I guess he felt that this seed of Abraham, Yitzchak, and eventually Yaakov, they will be the ones from which he will form a nation to whom he will give and entrust the Torah. And we did not always do a good job. But Baruch Hashem, I think Hashem is proud of us somewhat. There have been many, many tzaddikim, many people who have given their life for, for Torah. So there are some heroic stories as well. So in order to instill in us this pride, the Chachamim even composed a special blessing every morning that we should say. Shalom Asani Goy. We're thankful that Hashem did not make us a Gentile. Well, wouldn't you be better off as a non-Jew? All you have is seven. Yeah, but what did we just say before? You want two diamonds or you want 20? This one is, has seven. You're right. If he, if he does the seven, he has a share to the world to come. If he did so because God commanded him, he could be a good man. And that's his mission. That's his job. That's what it amounts to. Or, you want 20? Well, today we don't have a choice, right? We're part of the Jewish nation, but we need to understand that this is for our benefit. So when we say, Shiloh Asani Goy, we're not putting anybody down. Then why don't we say, Shasani Yehudi? Be positive. Hashem, thank you for making me a Jew. No, we're saying thank you for not making me a non-Jew. First of all, it's important that we understand that the blessing is to instill pride, okay? Not to put anybody down. But number two, we can't really say Shasani Yehudi because that is yet to be seen if you behaved like one. Just because you were born to a Jewish mother that makes you biologically Jewish doesn't mean you behaved and acted like a Jew. So why should you be proud of being Jewish? You can be proud with not having been born in, in Kenya, or well, whatever, you know, to a non-Jewish family, somewhere, right? That you can be proud of because, Baruch Hashem, now you can earn 20, for 20, you know, it was the reward for 20 diamonds, for 630 commandments. It's an important responsibility to be part of this club, if you want to call it a club. It's something to be proud of. It's a great responsibility. It's, it's very, very special and unique. So in order for us to be proud, David Amelech reminds us, Ashrei, you are, we are really indeed fortunate. Does he have to remind us that? Yes, because at times the Jewish people suffered. They were persecuted. They were expelled from the land. Their home was destroyed. If everything would be okay, he wouldn't have to tell us that. I mean, we would know that then. We sometimes think maybe Hashem is not on our side, God forbid. Look what happened in the Holocaust. Where is God? Yeah. No. Even during difficult times, remember that there is this Ashgaha. There is divine providence. Hashem is involved and intercedes on our behalf, even during difficult times, even though when we don't see it. Be proud of who you are. And if you don't believe it, you can, you can see, you can read what non-Jews have said about the miracles that they've observed with the Jews. You can read this, what Mark Twain wrote about the Jewish survival. A lot of non-Jews have said this. So this is not necessarily just coming from another Jew. Non-Jews have also indicated, have pointed out this fact. It's a fact. It's a historical fact that Hashem was always there for us. So we have a special kesha. We have a special connection. Do we maximize? Do we make good use of it? That's already another story. But the potential is there for a tremendous good connection, tremendous good marriage, tremendous good relationship with Hashem. Next pasuk. Mishamayim hibit Adonai ra'a et kol b'nei ha'adam. So Hashem 
looks down from Shammai, from heaven, and he beholds or sees all of mankind. What is he telling us that we don't know? That Hashem sees? Some people think that he doesn't. He's so far removed, he's so far away, they, didn't, they, they don't deny that he created the world. He created the world, but he's not around. You mean to say that God knows what everybody does? All these billions of people? Oh, really? No, that's impossible. Why are they having a problem with this? If God can create the world, if he can create a world, he can't know what's going on. Why do people have a hard time with this? Because they're confused, partially. They don't see the fairness that they would expect from a just and fair God. Why do the righteous suffer? Why are the wicked prospering? I mean, people have questions. So they, you know, have a problem with thinking, you know, is this God for real? I mean, is he involved? He's so far removed, he's in the heavens. And that is why he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't even see. Maybe he doesn't even care to see. Maybe he abandoned us. You know, there's all kinds of theories that they have. They don't understand why Hashem does it so. Intentionally conceal himself for things not to be too obvious. Otherwise, that would interfere with free will. That's a simple explanation, very simple. Of If you were God, and by the way, there is a book like that by Arya Kaplan, which I recommend. If you were God, if you were God, how would you do it? And think about it, how would you do it? You don't want everybody to know that, uh, I mean, you don't want everybody to have complete clarity that you're around. Otherwise, it's, imagine um, two workers or two situations at work. One where your boss sees what you're doing and one where the boss tells you, I'm going on vacation for three months and I expect you to take care of this. Aren't the two Situation is going to be very different as far as productivity. The worker who sees his boss looking over his shoulder, he better come on time, he better do his job right. The worker who knows the boss is not around, he's just going to, you know, take it easy and have four cups of coffee during the day, and then he'll have a break for maybe a, cig a cigarette and a break for a phone call and a, all kinds of breaks. He won't take the job so seriously. So if you were God, I mean, think about it. You know, how would you do things if you want people not to know you, that you are there completely, uh, because you know you want to allow them free will. You want them to to really prove themselves. Right? Would you be there? Would you make? Would you allow them to see you? Then we would be like robots almost. So if you were God, you would also conceal yourself a little bit. You would also do it in such a way that they know you're there, but you're not there all the time, perhaps. So this has led to some, I guess, confusion amongst the nations of the world. They were debating, you know, where is this God? So here David Amelak says, no, he does. Mishamayim he beat. He looks down. All the way from heaven, he looks down and he sees everything that is happening. There's a nice mashal uh, that the Chafetz Chaim gave. He says, all these inventions that he was able actually to hear about in the, at the beginning of the 20th century, cameras, recording machines that record, that were great discoveries. And the Chafetz Chaim says, you see, Hashem is enabling us to see that if human beings are able to produce a machine that can take pictures, permanent pictures. You don't think Hashem has a better camera upstairs that has recorded in color, not black or white, in color, <laughs> all of our actions from the moment we were born until the day we leave this world? We can do it. The Japanese have done it, right? Hard drives, digital drives, all the different forms of uh, retaining information, recording information. We can do it. He can't. Right? 
if we make a camera, we make a lens, he doesn't have a camera he can't see. We have telescopes he doesn't have. I mean, what? Well, the mind doesn't think well. If we can do it, for sure he can do it. People don't think about it. So yes, Mishamayim he beat. Hashem does look down. Ra'at, and he sees it, Kol Bnei Adam, and by the way, he can see everybody at once, something that we can't do yet. <laughs> you know, we can do a little bit at a time. One kilometer, two kilometers, depending on the resolution you want from the satellite. It's impressive what, what technology has done today in being able to see from a distance. From 24,000 miles above the Earth, you have satellites that can detect if a missile has been shot up. They can detect certain weather patterns. There are certain satellites that are not that far away. They're a little bit closer above the Earth's atmosphere. And they can read your license plate. Incredible. So Mishamayim Mibit Hashem, he sees everything. Who does not see? We say it in Hallel. All the Elilim, all the idols, so why would people worship these things that have a mouth, but they can't talk? Right? They have ears, but they can't hear. You know, it was in the past people worshipped idols. Now don't, don't look down too much at it. Don't ridicule it completely because there was some logic behind it. People didn't take just a rock and say, this is my God. Even though when you read about it, that's the way it sounds, like they did something so silly. There's a lot more to it, at least in the very beginning. They believed that, of course, all the powers in the world come from above. There was our powers. The stars have influence over this planet. So they wanted a way to relate to that power, to that energy, whatever you want to call it. So they created something physical that they can call Saturn, their god, where, where they are really referring to that power up there in that planet. But eventually it just became a stone without, with, you know, forgetting about the source of everything. And the source of everything is Hashem, who created those planets, who created all those powers. So they began, they began by attributing so much importance and power to these things that they forgot about the boss. You know, imagine, you know, somebody just gives credit and is grateful to the servants of the king and forgets about the king. It's the king who's in charge. He gave them, he empowered them with, with all the abilities that they have to run the kingdom. What's the word he beat? I, I like to ask these kinds of questions to those who know Hebrew well. I mean, you know, we don't necessarily use this word in, in regular Hebrew. And it's, uh, it's a little bit, uh, I guess, challenging for someone who does know the language, who thinks he knows the language, to try to figure out, but wait a minute, what's the difference between lehabit, lirot, listakel? I just gave you three words which mean to look, to see, or to stare. Okay, lirot means to see. Okay? I can see with my physical eyes, a niroe. Leistakel means to look. What's the difference between to see and to look? To see means you physically see something, and to look just in general. We look at a, we look at, we look at, we look at a picture. We obviously are seeing it, but we're looking at it, we're analyzing it. It's a little bit more than just to see. What is to stare? The term is to look steadily, right? So in English, all that makes sense. Well, in Hebrew, you have similar words. You have lirot, you have listakel, you have lehabit. Lehabit is a little bit closer to stare, but it's not really stare, the, the way we understand it in English. It's to view. Perhaps the view is a better word. What does the word view have more than to see or to look? What would you say? Hopefully you know English well, right? What, what does to view mean? What, what does view have more than to see or to look? Anybody want to suggest? Huh? To view. I'm viewing something. You're observing something. You view it's 
It's something that's done from... I'm observing. Very good. View, observe. Very good. Observe is the other word. Similar. How are they different than to see? Something that's in front of you. To, to, to observe it or to view it view is like view total. It's or like to take more detail into what you're looking okay. at. Okay. To view and to observe means to analyze it. To look more into it. To examine it. Right? So, Mishamay Mebit Hashem Ra'at Kol Bnei Adam For what purpose is he saying this? Because when Hashem looks down, he's not just looking uh, what are you wearing these days? <laughs> you know? He's not looking at us or seeing us for no reason. He's madbit, madbit for a reason. He's examining us. He's looking at our deeds. Plus, the Vida Melech is reminding us that Mishamaymash, he beat Hashem at all times. This habata, this looking down on earth, is also a, a form of Hashem's Ashgacha. When Hashem looks down, it means He is not only observing, not only viewing us, but is also... Involved? Is He involved? Invested. Yeah. He's also... What is that? Invested. Supervising. Supervising. Okay? He's looking down. Everything okay? What's, what's going on, right? So Hashem may be at all times. Now, if it's at all times, it's... It's very important to know that because if God forbid Hashem would remove Himself from looking down at us, if Dashgaha would be removed for one second, things would cease to exist. So in reality, Mishamayim beat Hashem. The word He beat is that Hashem is actually Mashgiach, is actually checking upon us, taking care of us, examining what we need. There's hunger, there's trouble, right? He's aware of that. Plus, there's something else. For those of you who recall another pasuk, Hamabit la'aretz vatirad. Hashem looks down to the earth, and the earth shakes. Right? An earthquake. Why do you have to say Mabit la'aretz vatirad? To bring about an earthquake, Hashem has to look down? Why does Hashem have to look to bring an earthquake? It says, Hamabit la'aretz vatirad. Habata also means that Hashem is judging. When He looks down and He's examining, observing what's going down, what's going on downstairs, down here in this world, He's looking at people's ma'asim, and He's determining, making a decision what to do about it. Do they deserve rain or not? So Mishamayim Hibit Hashem Ra'at et kol bnei adam to determine, to see how he should relate to us. Next pasuk. Mimechon shifto hishgiach el kol yushvei aretz. From his, I guess you can say from his throne in the heavens. Hishgiach. Here's the word hishgiach. He supervises. He watches over. He looks after. El kol yushvei aretz. Doesn't say the Jewish people here. It says all of in, all the inhabitants of the world. He takes care of the Chinese, of the, of the Thais, of the Vietnamese, also. He created everybody. Africans, Asians, Australians, Americans, everybody. No exception. However, there is a difference between Ashgaha Kralit and Ashgaha Pratit. There is a difference between Hashem's supervision over the whole universe, over the whole world, Versus his ashgacha over every one individual. The Jewish people have that kind of a relationship. Since we are called Banim Atem Hashem, we are his children, the ashgacha of Hashem over the Jewish people is for every individual. It's customized much more than it is with the rest of the world. Does that mean that there's no ashgacha pratid in everybody else? No, there is. There can be. Hashem can intercede for one individual in, uh, in Zanzibar, if you know where that is, right? in, Af in Africa. If Hashem chooses to, He can intercede for anyone. But generally, that special, unique relationship is only with the Jewish people. Whereas Ashgachah Kravit, the general Ashgachah, is with the whole world. 
The reason why perhaps it says Mimechon Shifto, why does it say it from his throne? Where else would Hashem be looking down? This could be alluding to Malchuto. Hashem reigns over the world as a king would. So his relationship to the world should be as a king to the inhabitants or to the citizens of the kingdom. The problem is that not everybody accepts him as king. What do we say at the end of Alenu Shabbat? By Hashem the Melech Al Kol Haaretz. When Mashiach comes, he will be king over the whole world. In the meantime, the Jewish people say, you know, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. You are our God. And when we say that, what are we, we, we what are we thinking of? I mean, Muslims say something similar too. What are we saying that's different? That we are accepting upon ourselves all Malchut Shamaim, Malchut Shamaim. In all Torah and Mitzvot. We are, by saying as, that, that we believe in him, it's not just that we believe, like certain religions say. Oh, I believe. No, no, no. When we believe, we are accepting upon ourselves the yoke of heaven, the yoke of the Malchut of Hashem, that he is the king, which means that I need to comply with his decrees, with his precepts, his commandments. That is a lot broader than just saying, yes, I believe in God. So that is perhaps an explanation of why he emphasizes here that this hashgacha, the supervision that's coming down to this world, is mimechon shifto, from his seat or from his throne in heaven. Now, the fact that he says Yoshve Ha'aretz, the commentaries say, it also implies that the hashgacha, the divine providence of Hashem, is even more felt in Israel than in any other country. And the Torah says so, Ene Hashem, the eyes of Hashem are on the land, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So Eretz Israel, as opposed to other countries, has a special Ashgacha of Hashem. You can blame El Nino and La Nina weather patterns in California. The weather is uh, not the way it used to be. Uh, you can blame all kinds of things on the uh, what do they call it? That the war, the war, the warming. Uh, global warming. Thank you, because of pollution and so forth. Fine, it's true partially. I mean, there is of course some man-made uh, problems that uh, has consequences. Smog. I mean, is is, is obviously one of them. Eretz Israel, however, the weather there is not necessarily related to the same rules that apply to weather elsewhere. It's completely Bashamai. And the laws or the rules that govern the land of Israel is completely in the hands of Hashem. Hashem can, of course, get involved anywhere He chooses to. But as a rule, from the beginning of the year till the end of the year, whatever happens in the economy, the weather, or our relations with our neighbors, has a lot to do with how the Jewish people are uh, faring spiritually. If they're not spiritually strong, they will know it. They will get a reminder somehow through the weather, there won't be rain, God forbid. Or there'll be trouble from the enemy. Or the economy won't do well. And then they'll try to fix it in some sort of artificial way. And it won't work because they don't realize, many of them don't realize, the politicians, that the, the issues, the issues that affect Israel are not similar issues that affect other nations. It's all in the hand of Hashem. It's because our relationship is suffering. If our relationship is not well, is not doing well, we will know it. Hashem has to let us know somehow, otherwise things will just get worse and worse and worse and it will never stop. When, when times are tough, especially when there's no rain, we have halachot of how to conduct ourselves, how many days to fast until there is rain. There's Gemarot about this. How the Jewish people conduct themselves historically. They went to the cemetery many, many times and prayed by the graves of the Sunday king for rain. Why? Because they realized that they better do something uh, drastically to call out to Hashem, to do Teshuvah, to repent. Otherwise, they're going to starve. So Hashem lets us know. That's all Ashgacha. That's the way you can see the Ashgacha. The Arabs in Iraq, I heard this from an individual who was there. 
this story goes back about 70, 80 years. He says, the Arabs went to the rabbi and says, Rabbis, only you can bring the rain. And uh, I don't know if they forced them or they pleaded with them, but the, the whole community went to the cemetery and they cried out to Shem. I think it was three years or it was a long time when there was no rain. After they finished prayers, they were being soaked with the rain. They, didn't, they, could, they couldn't run home fast enough. What's that? The greatest proof of Ashgaha. It hasn't been rained for so long. And after their prayer in, in the cemetery, all of a sudden it starts to rain, buckets. So there are many such stories, examples. So in, especially the Ashgaha can be seen more than anywhere else. El kol yoshvea ares, which means also in the Eretz Israel. Before we go on, I want to add a, an additional concept that many people, unfortunately, have a hard time with. They don't see how Hashem is so directly involved. Rabbi tells us in the Gemara that Hashem has three maftichot. Hashem has three keys. You may have heard of it. The key to rain. The key. Anybody know? Huh? Shidduchim. Very good. Shidduchim. To travel and the key, right? Shiduchim. There's different versions in the Gemara, but more or less these are the keys. What does a key imply? Why does it say Hashem has three keys? Why? That's all he has? He has no more keys? Mm -hmm. And there are other areas in life that we could use, that we benefit from. Hashem only has three of those keys. And why a key? Does Hashem need a key? What's the purpose of a key? to open and to close. There are certain areas in life that are sensitive. Childbirth, to have children, to have a future generation, to be a partner with Hashem in bringing about a soul into this world. This is no simple matter. This is a tremendous responsibility. This is a gift. Okay. Rain, which is really also parnasa, livelihood. Very, very important for people. Huh? And number three, of course, a soulmate your partner that you will hopefully build your home with. Keys means that sometimes Hashem closes it. Why? He has reasons. Closes rain, closes a woman's womb that she won't be able to have children. God forbid. Sometimes He closes, but sometimes He opens. Why does it say Hashem has the keys? I mean, He has everything. Only these three? These three, as we said, are sensitive. Everything else really depends more on the mazal that an individual is born into. We're all born into a certain mazal. So Hashem manages people's fate and destiny through this mazal. However, He retains to Himself these three. What this means is that, of course, He controls everything. He has planned everything. Everything is designed by Him. Everything is through His will. But He retains three maftechot, it says, wait a minute, even though the mazal may be so and so, these three areas I retain. The creator of the world says, I retain the right to open it up in case it was closed by the mazal, or to close it in case they don't deserve for something that they did, they did wrong. I'm going to close their mazal. So somehow, these three areas are more delicate than other areas in one's life. Yes? There's an episode of it where Hazrat Shmuel gives Elio and Abi the key to rain. Uh, the sure, old, sure. Uh, mm -hmm. With Papa. Right. And uh, why does he do that? Because uh, Elio and Abi was uh, he was a zealot, and Elio and Abi says, you know, for you're not going to have rain. Right. Hazrat Shmuel who may have wanted to give them rain. Uh, he agreed with him. That was uh, an opportunity that was given to the Jewish people to see clearly the hand of Hashem. There was a tremendous Kiddush Hashem. Uh, unfortunately, at that time, many people worshipped idols. Uh, idol worshipping was a very, very powerful, I guess uh, you can call it attraction. The evil inclination was very, very, very strong in that area. And somehow, Liao Navi, who was a zealot, wanted to do away with it. He wanted to prove how they are so false how that they, they can't do anything, that everything really depends only on Hashem. And not through hocus-pocus and, 
any other thing that you may try, even though witchcraft and even though all these forces out there are real, but they're fake. What, what that means is, is this is not the address that you should be turning to. These powers are more make-believe. They're trying to distract you from the real thing. It's a fake Rolex, <laughs> if we can call it that. It's fake. It looks similar because it, you know, you can do all kinds of things, but it's, it's not the real thing. It's not authentic. And you're falling into the trap because it's cheap, it's easy. It doesn't demand, idol worshiping doesn't demand that you wake up to pray in the morning, that you put on tefillin, that you keep Shabbat, right? Just like the cheap Rolex doesn't demand too much of you. Ten dollars. <laughs> the real one demands a lot of you, that you pay for the workmanship, that you pay for the name, that you pay for everything. So because of that atmosphere back then, the, the Avi, who was a zealot, felt something, they need strong medication. They need the real thing. And somehow that did it for a little while. You know. So whatever was, was done then was, of course, something that was, let's call it hora'at sha'a. Hora'at sha'a is an expression that's used uh, by the rabbis sometimes to describe an exception to the rule. For the time being, this is what we got to do. This goes against all the rules, perhaps, of, of demonstrating in public that Hashem is real. In other words, by doing something miraculous. We don't want to do that because we want people to have free will. But sometimes that's necessary. So that's what happened there. It was a very powerful message that unfortunately didn't last long. It eventually dissipated. But for the time being, it did whatever Eliyahu Navi intended it to do. And that was Kiddush Hashem to sanctify Hashem's name. I, yeah. read, I read it somewhere that the, one of the, another key was the Chiyat HaMentim, because what happened in Yohan, nobody wanted to revive it. Yes, that's day. another key. Yeah, key to, then, yeah. I gave a few examples. Yeah. Key of Chiyat HaMentim means to revive one who has died. Yeah, then, Hashem usually does that kind of a thing, you know, to bring somebody from, from death. And that will happen eventually when, after Mashiach comes, that there will be Chiyat HaMentim for everybody. There have been cases in our history of certain prophets who were capable of that, and other tzaddikim as well, at the time of the Gemara, who had that ability of techiyat amitim. Techiyat amitim is actually one of the highest abilities that a human being can attain. If you read the, the Sefer, the book, the Mesilat Yesharim, you will see levels, levels of growth. There's the level of uh, Hasidut and Perishut and Kedushan. There's a lot of levels that, are, that an individual, Jew or non Jew, can attain spiritual growth. The highest level after Eliyahu Navi, after being able to see Eliyahu Navi in person, is Techiyat Ametim, being actually being able to bring back somebody who was dead. I, it doesn't mean somebody who was dead maybe for two years, but <laughs> maybe it means somebody who was recent, who had recently died. Either way, it's a tremendous ability, and some Tanaim, some of the rabbis in the time of the, the early period of the Gemara, were capable of that. They had that ability. But usually that mafteach, that key, as you said, is Hashem. You know, Hashem is the one who decides who will live and who not, and it's not the doctor. The doctor says, oh, he has two weeks to live. <laughs> they don't decide. They think they know, but Hashem decides that will, they, will he survive or not, right? And if he died, will he come back or not? So that's all ultimately in the hand of Hashem. All right, so let's go on. Hashem fashions out their heart, and he understands all their deeds. What does that mean? It means that Hashem knows everybody's thoughts. Hashem knows the circumstances in which we act, in which we, you know, was the situation that uh, we're in. And He knows also our true potential. So Hayotzer, Yachad Ibama Mevim Kolom Asayim is letting us know that even though Hashem judges everyone, even though Hashem sees it, all of what we do, in his judgment, he's fair. He evaluates the circumstances 
the potential, the upbringing, our knowledge, our awareness, not everybody is judged the same. Some people were deprived of a Jewish education. Some people didn't grow up knowing certain things. They are dealt with differently. So it all depends on the circumstances. It depends on the individual. And Hashem is aware of all of that. No two people are alike. All right, the next pasuk. The king is really not victorious because he has a large army. The warrior is not necessarily saved because he has a lot of might. It's an approximate translation. Don't, mis don't be misled to believe that because this is a larger army that they will for sure win or because he is stronger, he will for sure defeat the one who's weaker. There are many instances in our history where the few defeated the many. When I say few defeated the many, what do you think of? Hanukkah, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't have to go back in history to Hanukkah. It's a six-day war. It was the same thing, more or less. The few defeated the many. It was so obvious. The whole world was amazed and impressed. How could they do it? Six days to defeat so many enemies around them? Because it has nothing to do necessarily with numbers and who's stronger. It's all from Shammai. So, don't forget, don't be discouraged. You see a very powerful enemy. He has a larger army than you. He's not necessarily going to win. Hitler was very powerful, millions of soldiers. But if you know the history of North Africa, during World War II, it's amazing what happened over there. The Germans were on their way to Israel, do you know that? El Alamein is where they stopped. The British were not more powerful than them. I'll just tell you one, maybe if I can remember a few details of what happened there. You know who was the German uh, general then in Africa, North Africa? Rommel. Rommel, a very smart guy. Not your average individual. Apparently, from what I'm told, he knew strategy, military man, he knew his business. Well, it helps. Experience helps, intelligence helps, strategy, I mean, creativity, I mean, all of this can, can come in handy. But let's not forget him. <laughs> Hashem is the one that really decides everything. But it helps. So on one, on one occasion, they're about to infiltrate where, where the British were stationed, where they were camped. They were about to either go around them or go through them. I forget exactly how they were going to do it. But this is the desert. So at that time, the, there was a big pipe in the desert. That big pipe was meant to provide water. You know, drinking water, uh, to supply drinking water for all kinds of locations there that, of course, do not have rain, do not have uh, wells, and do not and need water. So the Germans came across that pipe, and, and they said, great, you know, let's drink the water. The problem is that as soon as they drank the water, they all became sick in the stomach. That pipe somehow, miraculously, did not contain regular water. It contained seawater. They were testing the pipe. At first, they were going to test to see that there's no leaks. So how do you test it with real water? That's a waste. <laughs> right? They tested it with seawater, the British. So they didn't even realize what they were doing. Right? And then, I think it was the Germans who, you know, riddled the pipes with bullets to get the water out, or, or the British did it, I don't know. I don't remember all the details. But somehow they got the water out, but it was seawater. They didn't realize it until later that they were sick. And during the time they were sick, the British ran, you know, ran them over, and uh, basically many of them died and captured. And the rest of them ran away. That was just one detail. Once one little detail that happened that just 
frustrated the German plan, even though they were the smarter ones, probably the more powerful ones, probably the more numerous one. They had a better general. Oh, there's a whole story about uh, the British general who took over. The first one was assassinated. You know, the Germans uh, shot his car. And another one took over. Was it McCarthy? Mon Montgomery? I forget who it was. Yeah, the British uh, general who took over. And uh, one of them is American, one other one is British, I think. You're, you, you should know this. Who, Who's, which one is Montgomery? Which one is McCarthy? McCarthy was the American one, right? Yeah. McCarthy, right? Montgomery was the British one. And Montgomery was an average individual, not as smart as the other general that was supposed to take his place. But that general was assassinated by the Germans. So they had to replace him. It, it, the British didn't realize that they were replacing a good general with an average general, but it happens to be that the average general had what the better general did not have. It says, he tells his soldiers, go until you drop. That was his strategy, because it was full of mines. The Germans put a million mines. Go until you drop. He says, we have no way. We have no way to get you know, to the Germans unless we cross through the minefields. So go until you drop. And they dropped. <laughs> you know, many British soldiers dropped. But it was because of his strategy of, of doing something which was unconventional that they were able to win. That helped a lot. And it just happened to be, now I'm saying just happened in quotes, it's all Shamayim, that on, on that day that he decided to do that, Roma was on vacation. Because had he been there, maybe he would have discovered this. He would have figured something out. So if you start reading this history, you can only be amazed. How could this happen? They were the more numerous. Yeah. But what is it? The Pasuk says, Sheker Asus, Bichu'ah, Malek. It has nothing to do with numbers and intelligence and, and the might. It's all up to Hashem who will win. So don't trust in your horse. That's not the one what's going to make you victorious. So there are many, many such examples in our history. So he uses the word sheker as sus lechua. Why sheker? Sus, you cannot rely on your horse. He will not uh, help you out in time of need. What it means is that the, the horse could be a good horse, a, trust that he, a horse that you depend on. But what if he's sick? What if he gets injured? You have the best tank, but what if it's broken? What if it's stuck? <clears throat> right? You have tremendous air, air force, but something can go wrong. We've had F-15s crash, something malfunctioned. So you can have a mighty army, but check it. Check it as the Chua. You cannot depend on it 100% for the Teshua, that you will win, that you will stay ahead. There's an interesting story that I saw about the Barbanel, Rabbi Yitzhak Barbanel. He was a tremendous rabbi during the time of the Inquisition. He was originally from Portugal, then he went to Spain, I believe, then he was in Italy for a while. And uh, somehow he was on a mission, a military mission sent by the Spanish king, and he was on a horse. And somehow the horse stopped. The horse did not want to continue on. And it was very, very, very strange. He was puzzled. He said, this is a horse that I've had for a while. The horse refuses to continue. After a few minutes of hesitation and wondering what's going on, all of a sudden he sees an arrow being shot exactly at the spot where he would have been had the horse continued on. So he was saved. So when he was saved, he read this pasuk. He said this pasuk with a second interpretation. He says, Sheker asus lichua. You know why the horse was sheker? You know why the horse did not act the way he should? To help me out. Right? This is another interpretation. In other words, he reminded himself of this pasuk. 
Sheker Asus, the horse didn't behave himself, did not do what he was expected to do. Why? Lichua, because he wanted to save my life. And obviously it's not the horse, it's all Mishamai. The second half of the Pasuk, however, could also mean Berov Helo Loimalet. Sometimes the horse goes wild. And he takes the rider to his death. In other words, he will not escape. Berov Helo, even though he's mighty, even though he's strong and experienced, Loimalet does not guarantee that he will be victorious or that he will escape. In this case, I mean, the good riders and experienced soldiers sometimes fell to the death because the horse all of a sudden got scared of a snake, or of a mouse, <laughs> or something. And that's all Mishamayim. Everything is Mishamayim. All right, we have a few more Pesukim here. Hashem's eyes are, to, are directed to those who fear Him, to those who look forward to His kindness. What is he adding by this, saying this? He's saying that those who will benefit the most from Hashem's Ashgacha directly will be those who, should, who truly, sincerely rely on Him. Those who have true bitachon in Him. There are those who say they do, but they don't. It reminds me of an individual who once came to a rabbi. Rabbi, I'm having a hard time making ends meet. No parnasan, no larry. Can you help? Give me a blessing, give me an amulet, do something. And the rabbi says, listen, you don't have to go to work. If you have true bitachon b'ashem, it's going to come knocking on your door. Don't worry about it. He says, I assure you that you will have all your needs in a short time. How much are all your needs? He says, I need 10,000 rubles to continue my business. He says, if you have bitachon b'ashem, you have trust, you have faith in God, you rely on Him 100%, you will see it will come. You don't have to do it. Just stay at home, learn, say Tehillim, come to pray. If you have real bitachon, you don't even have to go. He goes home. Next day, his wife sees him at home. She says, why aren't you at work? He says, I have bitachon. My rabbi told me that if I trust in God, you'll see in a short time, the money will come knocking at the door. How long did your rabbi tell you to do this for? He says, for 30 days. After a while, time goes by, 15 days go by or so, he says, nothing is happening. So he goes to the rabbi, rabbi he says, so far nothing has happened, nobody came knocking on my door, Parnassah is not coming, how long should, should I wait, full 30 days? I mean, I, it's difficult to be without work, without any money for 30 days. He says, I promised you 10,000 rubles at the end will come knocking at your door. You don't believe it? He says, Rabbi, yeah, I, I believe it, but it has, nothing has happened so far. He says, Rabbi says, you know what? I have a deal for you. I have a second deal for you. I know you're getting 10,000 rubles very soon, but since you're desperate and you can't wait, I wanted to give you half now. And you give me the, when you eventually get the 10, you give me the other half. Will you take half now? He says, of course I'll take half now. He says, you, you better go back to work. He says, you don't have bitachon in Hashem. <laughs> How could you agree to take half? If I promised you 10, you agree to take half now? That shows that you don't have bitachon. If you have bitachon, you would say, no way, I'm not taking your five. I want the full 10 for myself. The fact that you're taking the five means that you don't really have faith in God. So you need to go to work. You can't wait at home. <laughs> Person who really has bitachon Hashem, really? It will come knocking at his door. That's the way it works. Now, we're not on that level. Don't make that mistake. Don't think of just because you have bitachon, you can sit at home. We're not on that level. But the, the big tzaddikim were, at times, you know, in this kind of a situation where they had no doubts that Hashem will come to their help. So Hashem's ashgacha is more felt with those who are truly yere'ah, those who fear Him those who look forward to his chazdo, to his kindness. Why does it say chazdo, his kindness? Because chazdo, chesed, is done with, even with those who don't deserve it. There are people who may not deserve the blessing of Hashem, but sometimes Hashem is kind to them nonetheless. So those who look forward to his kindness, that in itself is a big zechut, a big merit. Just because you looked forward to me, you believed in me, even though you may not deserve it, you haven't acted in a nice way, you haven't done 
what you're supposed to do. You haven't observed certain mitzvot, you failed to do certain things. Nonetheless, those who look forward to Hashem's chesed, those who really trust in Hashem, they will see it more than others. Why does it say, Ein Hashem, the eye of Hashem? One eye? It's a good question. Why does it say, Ein Hashem? It should say, Ein Hashem. It does say, Ein Hashem elsewhere, the two eyes. Why does it say here only one eye? So some commentaries say that it's talking about at a time when the Jewish nation may not be doing everything right, 100%. When Amisal is not doing Ratzon Hashem properly, they don't will do the will of Hashem 100%, only one eye is seen. When they do the will of Hashem, then you see the, the other pasuk, Eine Hashem, the eyes of Hashem, where the Hashgacha, where the revelation is a lot clearer. And it was with one eye, you see a little bit, but it's not as revealed. With the two eyes of Hashem, it's more revealed. However, I wanted to uh, perhaps suggest another interpretation. It says here, in Hashem Hashem looks after, his eyes are, in other words, observing or directed towards those who fear him. Those who are looking forward to him. For what reason? So the next pasuk says, to save them from death and to sustain them in their famine, in their hunger. That means they're in trouble, right? They're in trouble. They're looking forward to Hashem's help to save them from death, to sustain them in famine. Perhaps the interpretation, therefore, is, you know why there's one eye here? Because the people are already in trouble. Wouldn't it be better if there wouldn't be famine at all? What are we doing? We're asking Hashem, Hashem, please help us. There is famine. There's, there, there's trouble. Help us get out of it. So the people are in the trouble already. So the ashgaha, of course, is necessary. But that is ashgaha with one eye. You know what ashgaha with two eyes is? I won't let you get into this misery. I won't let you be in such a situation that you'll need to cry and beg me to get out of it. And I told you once, what's better? A guy gets, flies, goes on a plane, the plane crashes, Baruch Hashem, he survives. It's a miracle? Of course. Another guy gets stuck in traffic and never makes his flight. The plane crashed. Which one is better? Traffic. Which one is a bigger miracle? A bigger miracle is the one that the plane crashed. It is a bigger miracle. No? Most people don't survive a plane crash. But which one is preferable? The one who got stuck in traffic. Right. Well, who wants to go through a crash and go through the trauma? So to miss the plane is in some ways a much higher level of protection than to be on the plane as it crashes and stay alive. Oh, thank God, Hashem. It's a miracle. You saved my life. Yes. But that guy who didn't make it is better off than you. One eye, perhaps, to save people who are in trouble. Two eyes, to prevent it altogether. In other words, if Hashem is Ashgacha, is Aine Hashem, the two eyes, it means that it's so strong and more revealed that it actually would not even allow us to be in any form of trouble. Everything will be okay. Le'atzil mimavet nafsham, to save their, their lives from death and to sustain them in famine. Who was saved from obvious death? Abraham Avinu, his famous Midrash from the furnace. Daniel in the lion's den. Hananiah, Mishael, Vazariah also in the fire. Many, many stories where people were actually saved. I'll tell you one story that maybe you heard from me. This is with my sister's father-in-law, Lava Shalom. He was in Auschwitz. He and a group of men were already in the gas chamber. What were they waiting for? For the German to, to click or to pull whatever was the button to let the gas, to release the gas. That's all. They're undressed, ready to die. They knew they were going to die. What happened? All of a sudden, an officer arrived the last second. We need 
20 or 30 able young men to do some work. The Russians are approaching. I think to fix the train track or to do something. And they went out from the gas chamber. And before you know it, of course, the war was over. I mean, they were lived, the camp was liberated. So they were a, a few seconds from death. This has happened in many stories, many countless stories of how Jews were saved at the last second. What's that? That's not Ashgacha. It's obvious that it is. What about sustaining in famine? Many stories about that too. There was, I'll tell you just a couple. There was a story about a, a young couple who was very, very poor. You know, there were times in our history where people were really, really poor. They, they, they had nothing to eat. And you know, when the holidays approach, you need more money. There's more expenses. So what are they going to do? The husband tells his wife, you have no reason to worry. We trust in Hashem. Hashem has always been there for us. He will be there for us. But tonight is the hug. Don't worry, everything will be fine. She was a good woman even though she complained a little bit, even though she was fearful, as many, you know, would react in such a situation, nervous, but she figured, okay, well, let's wait and see what happens. She was looking around, fetching around for some clothing, I think it was, for the hag, and then she comes across a, a dress that she wore to her wedding that had some buttons that had some semi-precious stones on them. Well, I think there was only one button left that had a valuable stone. So she removed that button and she was able to sell it and provide for all the needs of that holiday out of nowhere. She didn't think of it, she forgot about it. She didn't, I mean, she doesn't wear that dress anymore. Who opened up her eyes? Who enabled her to see that, to think of that? Hashem, you know, oh, she stumbled on it. She didn't just stumble on it. You know, they showed her, look, you do have something left in your home that you can exchange for some money. There was another couple, also very, very poor, very righteous couple. They don't know what to do. They have nothing. Out of nowhere, an hour before the holiday, an hour, not two or three, one hour before, all of a sudden somebody comes to the door, knocking the door. I'm from out of town. My name is Nisim Hamitsri. Nisim the Egyptian. And I don't have where to stay. I'm looking, for, can I stay by you? <laughs> Imagine he's asking to stay by a poor couple, not in some fancy hotel. He looked presentable. So they said, we wish we could take you in. We would be glad to have you as a guest, but we don't even have for our own needs. That's okay. I brought all the needs for the hug with me in my suitcase. I have all the food. We'll all eat together. This is oh, beautiful. And of course, Baruch Hashem, they had everything they needed for the holiday. And the guest uh, stayed over that night with them. The following morning, the, the, the man of the house was going to take this gentleman to show with him, but he disappeared. Yes. Uh, obviously, this is one of those stories that we think it's, it was Eliyahu Navi that came to help out this couple in a disguise of a tourist mm -hmm. looking for a place to stay and brought the food with him. I mean, many, many such stories in our uh, tradition. But let me tell you something more recently. My grandfather in Israel, as you know, Israel was, was going through hard economic times in the 1920s, 30s, 40s. Uh, and my grandfather was already living there, he was recently married, and he did not always have a job. And if you were out of a job, it was tough. Even if you had a job, it was tough. The more so if you were not. And he, was, he just happened to be without a job one time. And my grandmother, Alehem Shalom, you know, was concerned. <laughs> she was always concerned. You know, what's going to be, she told my grandfather. What's going to be? And my grandfather would always rub his hands like this, with a smile on his face. He says, what's the worry? Hashem will take care of us. He's always done so. I have no doubt about it. And he meant it. He always had a very good disposition, always happy, very, very strong in his bitachon Hashem. And he would tell his wife, you will see, don't worry. Anyway, but he really didn't have a penny in his pocket. What are we going to do? Shabbat is coming. Anyway, so he goes out to the street, 
perhaps he was going to pray, perhaps he was going to speak to someone, I'm not sure why he went out. As he's walking down the street, a gentleman approaches him and says, Rabbi, I need to ask you a favor. In this, in this shul, we'd like you to give a class for the next month or so. And we'll pay you for it three shillings, whatever the money was then, uh, for, for teaching. You know, it was a nice amount of money for the month. Uh, three shillings, whatever it is, it was a nice amount of money that, of course, would be very helpful. So my grandfather says, okay, you know, thank you very much for the offer, and uh, when do I start? He says, start, you can start today. So after he agreed, the gentleman takes out the three shilling and gives it to my grandfather. He says, but my grandfather says, but I haven't started yet. You'll give me at the end of the month. He says, no, what do you care? Take the money up front. He goes home to my grandmother. He says, you see, here, take. <laughs> Take, do whatever you need with it. The man gave him up front. Who pays you up front for the whole month? You know, people are usually late. <laughs> they don't even give it to you at the end. This man says, what do you care? I have the money now. Take it up front. What is this? And right after their conversation, right after the war, expressions of worry, right after all of that concern, and my grandfather tells her everything's so, over, right after that, a few minutes later, he sees this ashgaha. Obviously, that's what we said before. Those who trust Hashem or look forward to it, they will see it. They will encounter this many, many times in their life. Our spirit, our nefesh, has always looked forward and trusted in Hashem who will help us and who will shield us. Even though we trust in Hashem. Sometimes we have no choice. We ask people for help. So why is David Amalek telling us Nafshinu Hiketel Hashem? He says, don't forget, this is the main address. Try to avoid as much as possible asking people for favors. The rabbis were against, against having to come out to people. The Pasuk says in Mishlei, Sone Matanot Yichye, one who hates accepting gifts, he will live. He will have a better life. You will live long, not to depend on people. Rabbis tell us, Make your Shabbat a simple Shabbat and don't ask people for favors. What does a simple Shabbat mean? If you can't have gefilte fish, have sardines with crackers. But don't ask for a loan. On the other hand, the rabbis tell us, you are allowed to beautify your Shabbat. You're allowed to. On the contrary, if you want to, if that's your intention, you go ahead and ask for money if you really need to. And make your Shabbat. Without Hashem, Hashem will repay you. But avoid it if you can. It's best to avoid coming unto people. Rabbis even tell us more than that. If you're an engineer and you don't have a job, Go sell stinky hides of animals and don't say I'm an engineer, electronic engineer. Right? Don't say I'm an important person, PhD from Russia, university. They came to Israel, some of them didn't just want to take any job. They don't have it, they, they don't know the language, they can't get just any job. Do whatever they give you. Go wash dishes in El Coyote restaurant across the street if you have to. <laughs> What's wrong with that? If you have to put food on the table, don't be ashamed. You're going to ask people for money? Chaz v'shalom. Avoid doing that. Nafshenu hiketel Hashem. Trust in Hashem. Look forward to Him. Ezrenu magineno. Who? That's the right address to call to. That's the right address to pray to. Unless you have no choice. If you have no choice, you need to. You have a responsibility to feed your family. You can't say, I trust in Hashem. If they're suffering and you have no choice, you're obligated to ask for help. The community is obligated to help you. But that's if you have no choice. If a person says, I can get by, but I'm going to have to have sardines and crackers instead of a sumptuous meal that I'm used to, try to get by in, in a simple meal for Shabbat. Better than asking people for favors. One needs to develop this trust in Hashem. And by asking and depending on people, uh, that may be lost. Hashem will, will gladden our hearts because we trusted in Him. Because Hashem will deliver. Those who trusted in Him will see that Hashem will respond, that Hashem will come and help them. 
and they will rejoice. In other words, people who truly trust in Hashem were never disappointed. That's the last verse. May your chesed, may your kindness be upon us as we've looked forward to you, as we have put our hope in you. The, the Perek, the chapter, ends with Midat HaBitachon. And the reason why he, he ends this way is to remind us how this one area is something that we could really benefit from if we strengthen this Midah. Our lives will be impacted in a positive way. Our whole, our whole attitude will change towards people and towards all kinds of situations if we, actually, if we, if we actually develop this midah to its fullest. All right, so what is the segula of this perek? You'll be surprised. Segula means we, that every perek of Tehillim, every chapter has a special power that if it is set, if one concentrates on it, it could be helpful in certain areas of life with certain remedies and certain problems. All of Tehillim is powerful. All of Tehillim is important. There's definitely great value to saying it on a daily basis, Tehillim. Very, very helpful. But certain chapters traditionally have more power than others for certain specific things. That's what a Segula means. Segula means a metaphysical remedy, a very special remedy, just by saying the words. So this one is a little bit interesting, not your typical. This chapter is for women whose kids have been dying prematurely. As you know, in the past, women lost their children as infants from all kinds of illnesses, from all kinds of situations. Uh, infant mortality, as it's called in English, was a big problem, not till not recently. Uh, today, with vaccination, it's a little bit easier. Ne nevertheless, all kinds of things can happen. So a woman who's been having trouble with this should uh, say this chapter. Plus, this is also a very powerful segula for uh, a community that is in deep, deep trouble. If there's a tzara in a community, a big problem in some sort, some Jewish community, some problem that they're having, everybody in the community should say this panic. It's a segula, you know, in the past, many communities suffered from all kinds of of situations, whether it was from their enemies, whether it was from the king, whether it was from economic problems, whether it was from rat infestation, all kinds of, they, you know, they were growing crops. There were all kinds of tsarot. And sometimes it happens today too. All of a sudden, a community is um, suffering out of nowhere. Tragedies, one after another. One has to stop and ask himself, wait a minute, this cannot be a coincidence. This is not a mazal. One after another is indicative that something is wrong. If a person is poor, that could be his mazal. But if a person is poor, and somebody dies in the family, chas shalom, and somebody is sick, and something goes wrong, and there's no parnasah, oh, one after another, you, you begin to wonder, this can't be, nobody has that kind of a mazal, right? What is it? It could be a terrible decree of Shammai. One has to examine his deeds. So it's very nice to be, hopeful, and it's important to be hopeful, but just remember, at times we have to look closely at what, what is happening and say to ourselves, but well, wait a minute, maybe I'm getting here a message that I have to change something, right? And it's not just prayer that's going to take it to, to, to make the change. I may have to do something more drastic. So Tehillim, of course, is powerful, but sometimes one needs more than Tehillim. One needs to do Teshuvah, one needs to do Tzedakah in order to overcome any terrible decree that may be out there. However, I want to repeat, Midat HaBitachon is very powerful in itself. And we saw it very clearly. Those who are Meachalim Lechazdo, who look forward to Hashem's help, sincerely have pure trust in Emunah in Hashem, pure trust. In, and they behave themselves, of course. They're God-fearing. They're not criminals. Because usually it's a contradiction. A criminal cannot have Bitachon. Because what does Bitachon mean? I don't have to steal. Hashem's going to help me. You see what I mean? So if an individual is righteous, individual, God-fearing individual, doesn't hurt anybody, doesn't speak Lashonara about other people, he's a fine individual. And he, on top of that, he has the Midata Bitachon. I can assure you that Hashem will always be there for him. Exactly.